Well, good evening. Thankful for each one of you that came out tonight. And uh, let me say this: I I understand the the sacrifice, the work all day, and then to be here. And I understand for the kids. The I'm sure the teacher said when Pastor Mike is preaching, no homework for the week, right? <laughs> I'm sure that's not the case. So um, let me say I I do appreciate your uh, willingness to be here tonight, and pray that God will encourage you in our time together. We have been. Uh, looking at the subject of hope, and I, uh, I hope that, no pun intended, but I hope that it has been, uh, the subject of hope has been a great encouragement to your hearts. I, uh, I'm amazed how, how much the Word of God has to say concerning our hope. And in the days and times in which we live as believers, we, we certainly need that hope. You know, Paul told Timothy, uh, and uh, I think um, it's a thing that, uh, a truth that we apply to all of our hearts, um, he, he said in, to Timothy, he said, Yea, all those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Besides persecution from the outside, we also know that we face trials. Um, we, we face heartaches. Um, there are things that come our way. I think we, we would all say that sometimes we, we just don't understand. I've, uh, I've often heard people, not within the church, but, but people I, I work around, um, people who I uh, talk to, um, will sometimes have the summation that the, uh, the world just isn't fair. And, uh, and sometimes as believers, you may wonder. You may wonder what, what God is doing. You may wonder what God's plan is for your life. You may wonder why. You know, I, we often think believers should not ask why, but um, I, I don't know about you, but there's lots of things I ask why about. Um, there's, there's lots of things that come our way that causes us to, to search our hearts. There's lots of things that come our way that we don't know the reason why. But I do know this. And this is a simple statement as we look at the subject for hope. But for the child of God, we do know this. We know the best is yet to come. And in that, not in that, in Him, we have hope. The Apostle Paul reminds us of this tonight. And, and uh, I hope... <laughs> Again, I'm, I'm, I'm using this word, no, no pun intended. I hope to focus more on hope tonight than I was able to uh, last night. But if, if you remember, as, we've, as we progress through, we, we begin by looking at our living hope. That Jesus Christ is our living hope. And you know, Peter definitely uh, focused on that and, and uh, made it very clear that, that it is through Christ that we have hope. We looked at our, um, that we have uh, a hope that is um, secure, that is steadfast. Again, being our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. That I love the way the writer of Hebrews says it, an anchor of our soul. And uh, certainly we, we have that hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Last night we looked at Jesus Christ as our blessed hope and and in light of that, we looked in the anticipation of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we truly believe that Jesus Christ is going to come again, we will be living our lives in a way that will bring honor and glory to his name. We as believers should not be ashamed of his coming. And tonight I want you to look as we uh, deal with the subject of hope that we, we see the Apostle Paul just reminding us, just reminding us the reward that hope brings. And we see it in beginning in Romans. If you would, open, can I tell you where to open to? Open your Bibles to Romans tonight. Sorry. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And I'd like to read tonight verses 18 through 25. Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 18. And 
going through verse 25. The Apostle Paul says this, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. You know, as the Apostle Paul begins this passage, and I, again, if, if, if someone uh, would ask you what's your, favorite passage, what's your favorite chapter in the book of Romans, uh, certainly Romans chapter 8 has to be one of your, your strong picks. You know, you, you begin with the great, great declaration that there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And, and you know, you, you, you think about the Apostle Paul beginning this chapter with that statement. We understand that we as believers, we will never be judged for our sins. Do you believe that? I will never be judged for my sins. Think about that for a second. And the reason we won't be judged for our sins is because Jesus Christ has already been judged for our sins. And because of that, we can live our lives. We, we desire to live our lives. And, 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 and back in chapter 6 of, of the book of Romans, you know, it, it doesn't mean that we shall continue in sin, that, that grace may abound, but, but because we have been set free, we are free to live our lives. We are free to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, but, but as we're saved, as, as we have this declaration, as we are set free, in the 8th in the chapter of Romans, we, we understand that God gives us His Spirit to guide and to direct us as we walk the path that God has called us to walk. And it would be wonderful. It would be wonderful if we could say, yes, I've been set free from all my sins. Christ has paid the price for all my sins. And yes, God has given me his spirit to lead me, to guide me. And, and uh, just in the, in, in the context of, of verse 14, you know, if we are led by the spirit of God, you know, we are gods. We are sons of God. You know, his spirit beareth witness with our spirit, right? That we are the, the children of God, that we are the heirs, as he goes on, this, the heirs of God. And, and, and that should bring joy to our hearts. That should bring liberty to our, to our, our, our walk with the Lord. But wouldn't it be wonderful if, if everything was just a, the high road? Wouldn't it be wonderful if life just went through and we could say, you know, yes, I'm led by the Spirit all the time, and, right? And, 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 and I yield to the Spirit, and, and, and you know, I, I, I live in light of the fact that Christ has paid for my sins, and, and, you know, everything's good. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could live that way? But we realize that in this world, we are going to have trials. And I submit to you as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is during those trials that our hope should be made manifested in the way we live our lives. The Apostle Paul begins here in verse 18 with a... With a uh, let me call it a sober assessment. I mean that in a, in, a, in a spiritual term. I mean a spiritual assessment. 
He says in verse 18, for I reckon. Now, we use that word sometimes just nonchalantly. Yeah? How many, how many times has your, your kids come up to you or, or someone's come up to you and said, hey, are we, can I do this? And, and we just say, what? I reckon. Yeah? I reckon. And sometimes it means, go ahead, I don't care. You know? But that's not what Paul means here. Paul's... This, this term that the Apostle Paul is using in verse 18 is, is, is really a, a, a mathematical term. It, it, it's a term of evaluation. It's a term of assessment. He is making a spiritual calculation. Let's say it that way. And notice what he is calculating here. He says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of which shall be revealed in us. Oftentimes when we suffer, we forget to look at the eternal. Oftentimes when we, when we, we, when we suffer, we forget to make the assessment that the suffering that we face on this earth is just temporary. And I realize, I realize that, as I say things, I, I, I never want to make light of someone's suffering. <laughs> that, that, that would definitely not be uh, the uh, letting brotherly love continue, would it? You know, um, we, never make, we, we, we never want to dismiss the reality of someone who is suffering. But as much as we don't make light of the reality of the fact that an individual is suffering, we also need to understand that that suffering, no matter how bad it may be, is nothing compared to the glory that we are going to have in Jesus Christ. It's that evaluation of the glory that's going to be revealed in us that will help us, that will drive us in our times of suffering. Hold your hand there in Romans. Turn, turn just over real quick to 2 Corinthians. It's interesting. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look with me, if you would, at verse number 6. Or excuse me, let me jump back to... Let's just jump back to verse 3. How's that? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comfort us in our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort of wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Verse 6, And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope, there's the word, and our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers with the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. It's just a reminder to us that as we go through trials, as we, as we, as we suffer, God uses it for his glory. And I have to tell you, <laughs> you know, most of the time I do this study on hope, I say, oh me, rather than amen. Because what happens when we face sufferings? What do we want to do? What do I want to do? I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to get out of it. I want to get rid of it. 
And often we forget to understand the, the spiritual assessment that the Apostle Paul is making here. The assessment that that suffering is nothing compared with the eternal glory. Christians have hope. Hope that not only their afflictions eventually will end, but that those afflictions actually will add, <laughs> will add to their eternal glory. As followers of Christ, we understand our sufferings will come from men. But remember, our glory will come from God. Our sufferings, they're earthly, right? Our glory is heavenly. Our sufferings, oh, they're short. Our glory, it's eternal. By the way, have you ever tried to grasp the word eternal? I tried to think about that today. I gave myself a headache. It didn't take much, but you, you, we really, if, if God didn't allow us to even have the word eternal, it, it's the only way that we can even come close to getting a grasp, and we, we still can't get a grasp on it, of the eternal glory that we have in Christ Jesus. Our sufferings is trivial. Our glory is limitless. Our, we suffer in our mortal, corruptible bodies, whereas our glory will be in our imperfect, will be in our, excuse me, our perfect and imperishable bodies. Quite a contrast, isn't it? Quite a contrast. And Paul reminds us of that. And because of that, as we make, as we understand that assessment, we understand that this assessment and this, this glory is not just something that we are anticipating. Notice as we, as we go on here, verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. I actually called this a stretching anxiousness. One of my favorite joys, and I, I figure most of my illustrations the rest of my life will be in this line. One of my favorite joys is being a grandpa. And it never fails when, especially Lincoln and Quinn are around me, and I try to sneak a piece of candy, and I grab it from the counter. It never fails. I, I'll... Put it in my mouth. Real quick. I mean, how do they see it? And all of a sudden, they're... <coughs> Papa. What you got? And being the good Papa that I am, no matter what I have, they get. But they, they're anxiously wanting to know, right? And, and, and this, this idea here, and, uh, when I think of this word, earnest expectation, it, it has the idea of, of a stretching anxiousness, the stretching of the neck, and, 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 and the anxiousness. And we see, really, a, like a personification of the creation, that there's this anxiousness for the expectation of the revealing or, or, or the manifestation or, or the, the uh, literal word uh, apocalypsis. It's actually a form of where we get the word revelation. Uh, the, the manifestation of the, the sons of God. You say, why? Why would the creation be in such anticipation? Beloved, they would be in such anticipation because the creation is affected by the fall also. We often forget the effect that sin has had, not only on our lives, 
but the effect that sin has had upon the creation. And at this point, I know I can say something that you may disagree with me on, and that's fine. Um, and again, I think, I think we can be good stewards, but, you know, no matter how well we take care of our economy or our world in which we live in, it is deteriorating. And it is um, affected by sin. Um, I'm, and, and as I say that, no, I'm not a member of the Sierra Club. But we've we got to understand the effects that sin has had upon not only ourselves, but the effects that sin has had upon the creation. And the creation is anticipating that day of the revealing, of the manifestation of the sons of God. And, and it goes on and explains, for the creature was made subject to vanity. And, and the idea there of, of being made subject to, to vanity or, or, or being uh, futile uh, gives the idea of, of, of something that's never able to accomplish a purpose. Something that, that has been a, affected by the, by the fall. Affected by, by sin. And it was subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Obviously, God told Adam, in the day you sin, you shall surely, what? Die. Die. The wages of sin is death. Hi, uh, not too long ago, there, there's a, a, a man I've been witnessing to a lot, and he runs with me almost every Every, every other day whenever we run, we were running, um, we were running a, a real steep hill here in South Parkersburg, but when you go up over the hill, you go down the other side, and then you go into the cemetery. And uh, we started running through the cemetery the other day, and, and I, said, uh, I said, hey, can I, can, I, uh, can I share a verse of scripture with you? And uh, he looked at me while we were running, he said, I don't care. You, I, you thought I was going to say, I reckon, huh? <laughs> but he said, he said I, I, I don't care. So I share with him the verse, the wages of sin is death. And you know, every cemetery that you see is a reminder that the wages of sin is death. And it affects not only us, but it affects the creation in which we live in. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And friends, the eternal life we have based upon the work of Christ on the cross. I would say it diminishes the effect of that sin, but it does more than diminish it. It cleans. It cleanses. Aren't you thankful as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us? And we live our lives in, in anticipation. And we have hope. The creation has been affected by the fall, and the creation is, is waiting, but the creation was placed in there because God told Adam. And Adam sinned. And the creation is affected by, by sin. But one day, one day God is going to change all that. And it's, it's interesting as you read passages in Isaiah. And, and uh, I, 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 won't, I won't take time to go there tonight. But 
But it, it's interesting in the scripture how the creation is personified. That that'd be that'd be another good study just to have a on the you know all the all the passages that that personifies you know creation. You know the hills clapping their hands. You know and and and, and rejoicing for. You know, the, the millennial reign of Christ. And, and we, we see here that the creation has been put into subject to this vanity, but not by its choice, but by, by the choice of, of Adam and the consequences that God has established because of sin. Notice verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. I don't know if you've ever been someone around someone who's in childbearing, but that's the very term that the Apostle Paul is using. I never will forget when Lisa was having Rachel. That was a long time ago. Don't tell Rachel I said that, but <coughs> I remember we decided when Lisa was going to have the baby that she's getting an epidural. And I, and I remember the doctor coming in and saying, he wanted to have the epidural. And I wasn't quite ready for all the speech he gives before he gives the epidural. You know, this could do this, this could do this, this could... I wasn't paying attention until he said, this could kill you. And that, that sort of got my attention. But anyway, after he said all that, we said, go ahead. But I'll never forget in the room beside us, there was a lady who was determined to have a baby. And if you're one of these people, I'm not making light of you. But there was a lady who was determined to have a baby without any medication. And I never will forget the doctor said, this is what the doctor said. This wasn't me. Because I could hear her next door. I mean, I could hear her. And he said, that lady's determined to have this baby without any medication, even if it kills her, and I think it might. <laughs> I'll tell you what, she was in pain. She was in pain. And you think of the pain that comes with, 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 with childbearing. And, and, and again, as we think about the, the, the consequences of sin, we know that the whole creation groaneth and, and, and travaileth in pain together until now. And Paul goes on and says, not only they, but ourselves also. How about you, but I get tired. I get tired of my battle with sin. You ever been there? You know, I, uh, <laughs> it's a daily battle. In fact, it might be for some of us. No, I didn't say you, okay? It might be for some of us an hourly battle. And I, and I can tell you this, as, as one who has to deal with people um, in, in certain consequences, I get sick of dealing with the consequences of sin. You know, not, not I mean, my own as well as others. I used to say this, one of the hardest things I, 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 I know this is going to sound awful, but one of the hardest things I get tired of doing is being with people when they die. And I know for the believer that's, be, that's best. I, I understand that. I got the theology of it, okay? But I, get, I, I, I hated being in a hospital and smelling death. I hate the smell of flesh. You know, those are, those are things I don't enjoy. I, one of the hardest, you know, I, I, I've seen bad things in, in combat situations. But I'm telling you, the thing that has woken me up more in my life is preaching the funeral of a three-year-old little boy, blonde hair, perfect, dimple in his chin, and the casket being open as I preach the funeral. 
I know he's better off. I know the theology. I understand. But I tell you what, I hate, I hate the effects of sin in my life. And I hate the effects of sin in your life. You know, the ways of sin is death, and, and when people die, that separates you. And I know the theology. <laughs> Got it? I keep saying that. I know the theology. But I also know what we have to go through here. I understand. I understand. I miss my loved ones who've went home to glory. I miss that time I get to spend with them. I got on Skype the other day and I still had my dad on Skype. I thought, boy, this would be wonderful if he answered. <laughs> Might be a little scary, but it'd be wonderful. You know? I hate the consequences of sin. It affects us. And yet, we know this, and, and Paul goes on and says here, but, verse 23, and not, not only they, but ourselves also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, in case we don't know what that's under talking about, he makes it very clear, the redemption of our body. You know, I, I, I say this often, and I, I know I'm preaching to the choir on a Tuesday night when it's raining and you're here. I, I, most of you, I, I understand that you know the Lord is your Savior, but I truly, I, I, I know we say this, but I don't know how much we live in light of it. If the rapture happened tonight, whew, our problems are over. You know? I know someone's going to say, well, yeah, but you've got to go to the judgment seat of Christ. Yeah, but I'm there. Yeah. I might smell like smoke, but I'm there. Yeah. I'm there. And in the midst of trials, we, 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 we are burdened with, with and groaning even, even within ourselves. And I'm thankful for the security that we have in the midst of that, knowing that we do have the Spirit of God, the first fruits of the Spirit, and you know, we, we understand in, in every aspect of the triune Godhead, you know, we, 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 in the Scriptures we see aspects of our security, you know, in God the Father, and God the Son, and even in God the Holy Spirit. You know, we, I'm thankful for the, you know, Ephesians 1.13, it talks about the sealing of the Spirit of God. You know, the Spirit of God seals us until the day of redemption. That's long enough for me. How about you? Yeah? That we are, we are sealed in, in, in the effects of the Spirit of God in each one of our lives. But we also understand that we live in this body affected by sin. But thank God that we have a solid assurance. And that's all assurance we see there in verse 24. For we are saved by hope. Now wait a second. I thought I was saved by grace, right? I thought I was saved by Christ, right? You, you can't separate it. Christ is our hope. He is our hope. When we're talking about the blessed hope, we're talking about the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we're talking about the living hope, we are talking about the fact that our Savior is alive and well. When we talk about, and, and even in 1 Peter, as we talked about that, that uh, Sunday morning, you know, we, we understand that, that that inheritance is eternal and sure. When we talk about the steadfast hope, the anchor of the soul. We're talking about Jesus Christ. We are saved by the gospel. We are saved in, in, in hope. And, but notice what he says here. But hope that is seen is not hope. <laughs> and he puts it down to where we can understand it. You know, if I'm 
if I'm walking down the road and I see that the bridge is out, I'm not going to walk across that bridge and say, hey, I hope it holds me. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And, you know, we, we talk about our hope, and, and, and I want you to understand here, uh, again, the word, in biblical, the word biblical hope, you know, my hope is safe. My hope is secure. My hope is in Christ. And my, and my hope is not a blind faith. My hope is settled in the authority of Scripture. I didn't see, I think I said this the other day, you didn't see Jesus Christ die on the cross. You didn't see him get in the tomb. You didn't see him raise the third day. We didn't see that, but we believe it. We believe it because the Word of God says so. The believer's hope is not based on wishful thinking or, or probability, but on the integrity of the clear promises of the Lord. Our hope is not that we might not lose our salvation, but that by our Lord's own guarantee, we cannot and will not lose it. My hope is built on nothing else than Jesus' blood and righteousness. It's because of Christ we have this hope. But if we hope for that which we see not, <laughs> we do it with patience. And the idea of patience is the idea of perseverance. Remember what I said? <laughs> what do we do? What do we do when our world is turned upside down? What do we do when the skies are dark? What do we do when we are hurting and feel that we are all alone? What do we do? Well, friend, I submit to you. We remember that we have hope. We have hope. And I may not see it today. I may not see it today. But one day, one day, I will see it. I was, uh, I was, you know, I, I understand sometimes I have a hyperactive mind and my mind wanders. I, I understand that. But I was thinking as I was driving here tonight of, of all those who have completed the race. I was thinking of a Harley McPeak. I, I can still tell you where they all sit. I was thinking of a Mr. Ruley. I loved hearing him pray. I had a hard time understanding him, but I loved hearing him pray. I was thinking of a pastor bill. Yeah. All those who have finished ahead of us. I was thinking of my dad, thinking of my mother-in-law, my father-in-law. But you know what? They've ran their race in Their hope is seen. We're here for a reason. We're here for a reason. And I truly believe in the days in which we live 
we are going to face more and more opposition for the cause of Christ. I really believe that. And it's going to be easy to get discouraged. It's going to be easy to want to quit. It's going to be possible even to feel like you're losing all hope. I want to remind you, our hope is in Christ. He's our hope. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for tonight and thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray again that it would be an encouragement to those who have heard it. Father, take it by thy spirit and use it for your honor, for your glory. Lord, I pray that, specifically, I, I pray tonight, Lord, for those that are here. I, I don't know what they're going through. I don't know what they're facing. You do. And Lord, I pray that we would be reminded from your word tonight. Lord, that we might be able to say with Paul, that the sufferings that we are facing here is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. And Lord, we realize that that is all because of you. Jesus, I thank you for that. I thank you for your obedience to go to the cross and pay the price for our sins that we might have life. And that one day we will share in your glory. Father, may that be our thoughts in times of suffering, in times of heartache. May we remember the eternal. In Jesus' name I pray.